Okay, so last time we did a lot of algebraic work to establish this relationship between the semi-major axis, the semi-minor axis, and the eccentricity of the ellipse. Okay, so before we do a bit more exploration and investigation about what this relationship reveals, uh, first let's just do some sort of low-grade uh, mechanical type stuff, stuff that we can work out based on this. So if we have an equation of an ellipse, Okay. We can use this formula to work out where all the important features are. The focus, foci, the directrix, the directrices, and uh, by extension, the eccentricity. Okay. So how do we do it? Well, have a look at this. You can see this is the larger length here. So this is going to be the semi-major axis squared. Okay. This is going to be the semi-minor axis squared. So now we have these two pieces which are going to fit into here, which as you can see, once you solve this, you'll have a value for e. Okay. So let's just quickly do that. You've got 5 equals 9 minus 9 times 1 minus e squared. So shift things around a little bit. You've got 5 over 9, 1 minus e squared. Subtract 1 from both sides. Uh, or maybe, rather, add e squared to this side and subtract 5 over 9 from this side. That gives you 4 over 9. And now you can take the square root. Now, we are only going to take just the one value, the positive one, because remember what eccentricity is. It's a ratio, okay? So therefore, it's positive, okay? So there you go, that's eccentricity. Now, how do I use this to work out where the focus, foci, and the directrix, directrices are? Well, remember that we established that the focus was at plus or minus AE, comma zero, okay? So, it's at zero because what you've got is an ellipse centered on the origin, okay? So that's why you're right on the axis, okay? Now, it's plus or minus because of the symmetry you've got both sides there. Uh, so you're gonna have two foci. Now, A in this case, since that's A squared, that implies that A is three. And that's what I'm gonna need along with the eccentricity to work out where the focus are, foci are, okay? So here, you're gonna say, plus or minus 3 times e, that's just 2. So there are the two foci, okay? In exactly the same way I can work out where the directrices are, they're going to be x equals plus or minus, again because there are two of them, a over e, and that'll tell you where, how far across you are. So what do we got here? Plus or minus 3 over 2 over 3 which gives you 9 over 2, which is 4 and a half, okay? Now, just before we move off this, suppose I shifted it around a little bit. Let's take this ellipse. Let's consider what happens if I change the values. So if I go x squared on 5, y squared on 9, okay? What's going to happen there? Well, because now the semi-major and the semi-minor axis are not arranged they were the way they were before, this now is the semi-minor axis, the horizontal one. That's b squared. This is the semi-major axis, which is vertical. So instead of being, this thing would be uh, flatter, like so. Okay. This thing is going to be thinner, like this. Okay. Now, since therefore we're thinking about the uh, axis, semi-major axis and semi-minor axes being swapped around, everything else is also swapped around. So the foci are no longer on the x values being both sides, they're on the y values, okay? So you're gonna have the foci being at zero plus or minus two in this case, because I've just taken the same values over. In the same way, the directrices are gonna be these horizontal lines over here, which gives you y equals plus or minus four and a half. The same values, it's just y instead of x, switched around. So that's how you can take a standard form equation ellipse, use this relationship b squared a squared, 1 minus e squared, and get out the main features, focus, directrix, and so on. Now all of that's pretty pedestrian, to be honest, okay? We want to do some investigation. Okay, so some of the questions in the textbook, they'll say things like, uh, examine the behavior, or consider what happens when, right? So I want us to think about this b squared, a squared, in particular, 
as the eccentricity changes. That seems to be the most useful, um, fascinating thing. It gives us whole different shapes. What happens as it changes? Okay. So what things do we already know? Well, if I consider uh, E equals 1, E equals 1, well, what happens to this equation, right? That creates this effect, B squared equals A squared times 1 minus 1, so it's equal to 0. Now, what does that mean? Okay. Well, a semi-minor a semi axis of, of nothing. Uh, the reason why this is a problem is because what is eccentricity 1? Okay. Eccentricity 1 is a parabola. So it doesn't have semi-major axis or semi-minor axis the way an ellipse does. Okay? All right, that's fine. Well, let's consider then what happens as we reduce the value. Okay? Now, we already have seen, I think the very first ellipse you considered had an eccentricity of a half. This uh, ellipse has an eccentricity of two thirds. So we've got all these fractional values. What happens as E approaches zero, as it gets smaller and smaller and smaller? Hmm. Now, we're going to write this out with some proper language, okay? So I'm going to take the limit as e approaches 0 of b squared, okay? Now, I want to try and examine, just like here, what happens to the semi-minor axis. Well, the limit of this as e approaches 0 is going to be the limit of this as e approaches 0, because they're the same, right? So you've got the limit as e approaches 0 of a squared 1 minus b squared, okay? So... What happens here? Well, because unlike when we were doing this with first principles, this limit, I can actually just evaluate it at zero, right? I can say that's going to be a squared times one minus zero. A squared times one. What does this tell us? As E approaches zero, B squared is going to be A squared when you get there, if it were possible, okay? Well, what kind of scenario is this? Well, if we, for instance, have a look at this, b squared approaching a squared, what kind of shape would you get? Um, this is our example here. You'd have x squared on 9, and you've got b squared, which at that case was 5, but if that's approaching 9 as well, what kind of shape is this? And the answer is, if you multiply through, at least in this case, it's a circle, set of the origin. Hmm. So stop for a second, just... Take, take mental stock take of what's going on. As E approaches zero, as it reduces and reduces and reduces, it doesn't make much sense to say E equals zero because E is ratio. What does it mean for something to be in the ratio zero? That doesn't really compute. But as you approach there, you're getting something like a circle. Okay? And this is starting to dig at the very idea um, or the re very reason, rather, of why, you know, E means, we've given it the name, eccentricity. Okay? Um, you can tell it's, it's the same as the word eccentric. It's just, you know, adjectives of nouns. Um, what does eccentric mean? When you talk about someone who is eccentric, their personality is eccentric, what we tend to mean is it's kind of like, you know, you've got a group of people normal group of people and then you've got a guy and he's sort of different from the rest of us okay he's sort of off center okay that's what we mean by eccentric uh, you can take a word like concentric and see how it it means something quite different it means that you've got some pe some things which are the same center okay that's what concentric circles are yeah so therefore what does eccentricity mean in the context of these shapes right when eccentricity is zero, if such a thing were possible, you get a circle. As you increase the eccentricity, you get something which is circular, but it's not a circle anymore, okay? It's going to become stretched out or, or squashed, those kinds of things. Okay? As the eccentricity increases even further, you don't even have a shape which is closed anymore. It sort of breaks open, okay, when the eccentricity is equal to one. Which then begs the question, well, what happens when the eccentricity goes further? Okay. Well, that's what we're going to have a look at next time, the kind of shape that we get. Um, some of you may already know what the shape that, you, that emerges out of this is, but the real question is, why is it that shape? Uh, and what does it have to do with the whole name of this topic, which is, you know, conic sections? Okay. What relationship do all of these pieces have together? 
That's what we're going to explore next time.